Crafts Drive presents. Oh, got to get ready. La Top plant. That looks nice there. Ooh, cookies, yum. Notebook, microphone, webcam, and coffee, of course. A video podcast where deaf, hard of hearing, and disabled creatives and their allies chat about experiences, best practice, and the future of the arts. The Green Room. Hello and welcome to The Green Room, a weekly video podcast produced by The Strive Collective, a collaboration between Hot Coals Productions and The DH Ensemble. My name is Jennifer Bates, or Jen, everyone calls me Jen, and my sign name is like this. So we take our two fists and you can put them kind of in front of your body, in front of your chest, and you shake them from side to side. That is my sign name. It is ridiculous, but we we love it. Uh, I am white. I have longish, darkish, reddish hair. I am wearing a blue top. I have a kind of creamy background, a wall in my house. There's a white radiator also behind me. Uh, in my house in Glasgow, um, and there's a green plant kind of poking in the frame as well. Uh, I, I am Scottish. I speak with a Scottish accent, and I am very happy to be here today. Uh, interpreting for me today, the, the BSL version of me is the lovely Anna. And I wonder, Anna, if you would like to introduce yourself. Sure, sure thing. Yeah. Hello, my name is Anna. My sign name is this. So you pretend you have full sleeves and one arm at a time from the wrist up to the elbow. You roll them up. I'm a white woman. I have brown hair to just below the shoulders. I'm wearing a dark grey top with a yellow stripe down the side. And my background is plain white. Fabulous. Yay, that's Anna. So Anna will be the BSL version of me. Uh, we've also got another couple of interpreters in the chat, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so over 12 weeks, we have been having uh, some fascinating conversations with some of the most exciting deaf, disabled and neurodiverse talent and industry allies here in the UK and internationally. We've been celebrating best practice, spotlighting unsung heroes and inspiring others to keep access and diversity front and center in the coming months and years. Uh, every Thursday at 7.30, we publish a new interview and you can find details of those on our website, on the project website, or on the YouTube channel or on our social medias that's your kind of thing. Uh, if that is your kind of thing and you do want to get involved in the chat, you can use the hashtag. Now it's hashtag the green room underscore UK. So that's hashtag the green room underscore UK. We got it, we got it, we know what we're doing. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna introduce my amazing guests today. I am honored to be having this chat with these two. Um, we go way, way back, but we'll get to that as well. Um, we've got uh, Brooklyn Melvin, woohoo, and we've got B uh, Webster. So I'll do a quick uh, bio snapshot, if I may. So Brooklyn is a deaf actor. Theatre credits include Oliver Twist for Leeds Playhouse and Ramps on the Moon, uh, Last Woman Left, and love and information at the Royal uh, Conservatoire of Scotland. Uh, they what also was the last one, sorry, Jen? Oh, it was love and information at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Uh, also, uh, Brooklyn creates loads of amazing films, short films, um, features in tons of sign songs that you've probably seen all over your social media uh, if you follow her and um, also a, a fabulous uh, facilitator and director i just want to put that out there um, about brooklyn and just to say brooklyn was also nominated for um their role in oliver twist uh, for the stage debut awards 2020 yay absolutely amazing um, and then moving on to our B Webster. Uh, B is also a deaf actor um, and a writer now as well. <laughs> uh, theatre credits as an actor <laughs> include Peeling with Taking Flights Theatre Company, Mother Courage and Her Children with Red Ladder Company, 
And uh, in her role as Katrin in, in that play, B was also nominated for the Stage Debut Awards 2019. There we go. Uh, B is also a published poet. And B's poem, Long Lost Lover, is about um, B's birthplace of Thailand, which is available in BSL and English. I missed the it's name of that, called Jen. Long Lost Lover. Okay. Yeah. Um, and B is also a drag queen. <laughs> and it is currently working with Pitlock Cree Festival Theatre in the Winter Ensemble and is at the Royal Shakespeare Company in the Winter's Tale. I missed the name of the festival. The, oh, um, it's Pitlock Cree Festival Theatre. Pit Lock. Three. Festival Theatre. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so she's part, part of the Winter Ensemble. Um, and then is also, also uh, in the Royal Shakespeare Company um, and is currently doing The Winter's Tale. So Hunters. And that is literally just a snapshot of the two of them. And we're just going to stop there for the moment because we'd be here all day if we kept going. So, um, <laughs> there's loads of things that we could talk about. That's the formal introduction -y bit over. We're all going to take a nice deep breath, have a little chill pill. Um, this is not a performance. I'm going to take my performance voice off, relax it a bit. Uh, we're going to picture ourselves in our favourite green room. Uh, we are sat on our warm sofa. There's a, this is a calm moment where you get a little drink, the familiar smells of a microwave meal and nervous actors are wafting in the air. Um, and we just have a wee catch up and a check in and enjoy some banter with our fellow company members. Amazing. So I have done a wee bit of a bio about you guys, but if you can now introduce yourselves, B and Brooklyn, tell us um, who you are, where you're from, and a wee description, a wee audio description as well, please. B, first. <laughs> Me, oh, okay, right. Oh, so I'm B, and this is my sign name. So you take your thumb and your index finger, put them together, and the other three fingers you have up in the air, like the shape of a B, and then you shake your hand forward. You, the B does not fly backwards, up or down. It flies forwards, I'll have you know. <laughs> That's my sign name. It's also the sign for B, the, the uh, animal, and it sounds like my name, so that's why that's my sign name. And so I'm mixed race. Um, part Asian. I've got um, sort of messy brown hair, which is tied up uh, in a high. What's the sign? Uh, it's 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 tied up high, and I've also got tortoise shell glasses, and um, I've got a brown Adidas top that I'm wearing, and in the background there is a sort of an old cottage I can see out the window, and to the west, and at the Behind me, it's um, red, white, hang on, what am I saying? It is, uh, there's a black cross on a white wall. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I'm going to introduce my voice, my interpreter, Erin. Um, <laughs> so hello, everybody. I'm Erin. I'm B's interpreter. My sign name is the sign for lipstick. So similar, it's actually the same hand shape as B, but you take that and you pretend that you're putting on lipstick. Um, I am a white woman, quite tall, I'm five foot nine. Uh, I've got a blue top on and a gray background. Fabulous, great. Well, so that is B and Erin. And then uh, Brooklyn, would you like to say a little bit about yourself? Hi, this is me. I'm Brooklyn, and my name sign is like making the shape of an O with your hand and then a K in the American Sign Language because I usually say OK a lot. And so they gave me the OK sign. 
So, of course, I'm very cool, of course. <laughs> um, and I am wearing a white T-shirt, jean jacket, grey cap with an orange logo on it on the front, clear glasses, and I have a background behind me which is white and greyish silver. Also, I am from Glasgow in Scotland, so that's great. Okay. And that is very important information. I also forgot to add that. Um, <laughs> I am from Glasgow, but I live in England. It's the Scottish day today, folks. Scottish. Welcome to Scotland. Uh, and Brooklyn, who is providing your voice for this uh, chat? Who's your voice? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. It's my lovely interpreter. I forgot about her. It, it's <laughs> Julie. I'm so sorry. Hi. Uh, my name is Julie. My sign name is Julie, which is like an identity pass being drawn on your chest where a lanyard would have would hang it down, so Julie. Um, I am a white woman. I have silvery gray hair. Uh, I am shorter than Erin. I am about five foot two. Uh, I am wearing a dark green jumper and my background is a red wall with a radiator in the corner that you can see. Fabulous. Welcome everyone, Full House. Um, this is going to be a good one. So, great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's, it's so lovely. Uh, we've had a really wide range of brilliant creatives on this uh, podcast, this video podcast. Um, and it's just great to always start with a bit of background uh, from, from you guys. So if you can tell us, um, you know, just a bit about yourself. How did you find your way into this industry? Um, uh, what have you been up to? Um, and how, how did it all begin? How did it all begin for you? Uh, B, would you like to start us off? Hmm. From the very beginning. <laughs> right, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, really, the very, very beginning, I was in, oh, I don't, almost can't even remember. Um, it was a youth theater. I think I must've been about eight years old. And I think it was at Mitchell Library in Glasgow, so if you know that, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I was in there and then uh, Deaf Youth Theatre was set up. So then I got into that and that's how I met Brooklyn for the first time. And then we've been best friends since then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then that was a Solar Bear established Deaf Youth Theatre. So that's how I got into that. And then the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland set up a course for deaf and hard of hearing actors, which I then went on to do. So that's a very condensed history of my um, acting career and experience. That's br brilliant. No, that's lovely. And um, since graduating, you've, you've seemed to have done so much. I mean, that, what I said before was a little snapshot of your bio, but it feels like you've been a very very busy person. Do you want to quickly tell us kind of what does a day-to-day -day look like in, in your life at the moment? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I guess I don't have a normal standard day. There's, it's never the same for me because I'm freelance. So it varies so much from day to day. Um, yeah, I was really lucky to have a job offer before I graduated. So I knew I had a job to go to, which was so lovely to, to know. Um, but, you know, I do all sorts of things, captioning conversations, creative conversations, consultancy for BSL. Um, I, I, I don't want to sit there not working and not getting any um, income. So I have to sort of have a portfolio career like that. Because sometimes with acting, it could be three months, six months between jobs. So I feel like you've got to have lots of varied roles you can do. And through lockdown, there's been loads of Zoom, 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 which, you know, obviously is so hard. It's just so tiring on your eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Zoom fatigue is very real, isn't it? And particularly when you work with a visual language. Yes. Particularly when you're just having to focus on someone signing in a 2D fashion. It's, it's really tricky. It's really hard. 
Oh, you want to get those eyeballs out and polish <laughs> them and then pop them back in so you can see again. Absolutely, absolutely. So there's so much I want to chat to you about, B, but I'm going to ho hold that and jump over to Brooklyn and get, um, get a little background from them. So tell us, um, how, how did it all begin? How did you find your way in this industry, Brooklyn? Well, quite similar to B, originally I was interested in acting and at school and then I became in the, uh, a member of the Deaf Youth Theatre, really just as a hobby to begin with, to be honest. I didn't have any great ambition to become an actor at that point. I spent a few years in DYT and then I thought, oh, I, I think this might be what I would like to do in the future. And then after a few years, I joined the course at the Scottish Conservatoire. Was it Deaf Theatre and Skills or something? Deaf Theatre and Signing Skills, maybe? Yep, that was the it one. Was yeah. Deaf Theatre Skills School. Yeah, yeah. That was well, it. I, I think, think it's been changed. changed and shortened, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think they've changed the name since then. But anyway, oh. um, yeah, so that was how I got involved. I did uh, um, two years there. I think it was two years. And then I've become a full-time BSL performer. Uh, I graduated. I didn't apply for any jobs. Uh, immediately it was quite slow to begin with and I had time I was patient about that I wasn't in any great rush and then I also became a, a trainer for the deaf youth theatre yeah a trainer for the deaf oh, youth like theatre oh like a facilitator oh cool all right yeah and, and helped out with workshops and things like that creative theatre skills creative leadership uh, and that's me, basically, in a nutshell. That's where I've been up until now. Yeah, that's perfect. That's so great. Um, so I do want to bring up that Brooklyn and B and I have known each other for a very long time. And uh, we met uh, almost 15 years ago um, when B and Brooklyn were at uh, Solar Bear's Deaf Youth Theatre. And when they were very young teenagers, figuring out what they were going to do. I was also quite a young director <laughs> and I would, uh, I worked at DYT um, and I facilitated and directed with Brooklyn and B. and uh, we have many, many happy memories, so many good times um, from DYT. So I'll be forever grateful for all those memories. Um, so just to put that out there and uh, to let you know we have history. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, the conservatoire then, because you uh, both were the first cohort to graduate from this course, this course that was specifically set up for deaf perform deaf people to become performers and creatives mm -hmm. in theatre, um, and it was the B, it's B performance in British Sign Language and English. Um, and, you know, just to say a massive congrats for us being the first, you know, absolutely trailblazing um, with that. And um, I wonder if you can uh, speak to maybe there's a moment throughout your drama training um, that was maybe a kind of aha moment for you, uh, a sort of moment where you went, oh, that's the kind of artist I want to be. That's what it's all about. I wonder if you can kind of pinpoint something through your drama training. Maybe it was a moment in rehearsals, maybe it was a moment in a class, maybe it was something you read. Um, I wonder if you could give us a wee pivotal, pivotal moment for, for us to think about. Go yeah. ahead. You, B, do you want to go first? <laughs> oh, it's a difficult question. Have you got anything, Brooklyn? I have one thing in mind, yeah. I, I should probably clarify before before we we start th um, thinking about the conservatoire. When we worked at the DYT, the Deaf Youth Theatre, we did a lot of improvisation work. We used to do a lot of work that was um, devised at the time and not very much script-based work. And when I actually started 
to um, work on performing. That was when I realised, when I joined the Royal Conservatoire, that they had scripts, and I never worked with a script before. And I discovered that I absolutely love working with a script and the idea of how to take it from the page into a living, acting being. And I just loved that. So my devising work became a little bit more remote and I became much more script focused. Uh, and that was perhaps my aha moment then. Oh, I, I love that. I love that a lot. Because um, you know, so often when we talk about, say, translation, um, when we're working with um, deaf actors, because you so, so much the scripts are so English heavy and and all of that. But um, if if you know you you really love the challenge of the English and then making it your own, you know you put it you take it from the page and you put you put it in your body. You know I've I've seen you as an actor and I've seen you do that, and um, and I think that's a really brilliant skill to have. I think that's excellent that you. You've acknowledged that about yourself. You know that about yourself. That's really uh, lovely to be that aware. Um, that, that's a passion of yours. It's great. Um, and B, I wonder if do you have a an, an ah? That's what it is. Oh, that's what it's. That's why. <laughs> so. Basically, I joined the course in the second year, so I missed the first year. I just, the confidence wasn't there. I was quite insecure about my abilities. So I'll give you a little bit of background before I get to the point of answering your question. So I was on the train from Newcastle to Glasgow. There was a group of us and uh, from the course, and I was a little bit upset because um, I was just thinking, you know, should I become an actor? Should I become a performer? I've never seen people that look like me on stage. I've never really seen East Southeast Asian people on stage, uh, deaf people, queer people, or the intersectionality of those identities, working class people. It's very rare to see. So I was talking to the people I was with, and I thought, well, no, maybe I just have to, uh, you know, be my own agent. Maybe I'll have to write and create my own work. Work. And so we, we journeyed on the train and then we got to our showcase and I was absolutely shocked. I loved the showcase, um, the, the scenes that were, that were performed and with different feedback that I received, I realized that actually I could control lots of things. I could, um, you know, I was very surprised by the positive reaction. It was really amazing and I was really shocked by it. People were laughing at things I hadn't expected. I guess I'd, I'd been so insecure prior to that. And after that, I had an email from an agent. And that's when my confidence just absolutely skyrocketed. I knew I could do it if I worked hard because, you know, I did. I really worked hard for that. I didn't just think, oh, can't be bothered. You know, I, I, that hard work really did pay off. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything of what you just said, I want to pick apart and talk about. Um, when you talk about representation, um, I, I mean, we could we could go on for days. And actually, let, let's let's actually talk about representation just now because I think it is really important, and I do really want to talk to you guys about this. Um, so you have both worked in big mainstream theatres now. Um, Brooklyn, you were at Leeds Playhouse as the title role. Um, and uh, B, you're at the Royal Shakespeare Company. I mean, that is, that is known for being white, upper middle class men, male actors, yeah? And then here you are representing all the identities that you guys are representing. And it's, it's brilliant to see that happening. It really is great. And it does make me you know, feel like the change is happening. And I really want you to, to tell us what your experience is as actors and writers with all the identities that you have. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, here's the floor. Uh, Brooklyn or, or B, who would like to go first? Uh, shall I? Yeah. You. Um. <laughs> yes, you do, you go. <laughs> yeah, when I graduated, I felt a bit like, at last. And then, then I, I, I had a good look at myself. Uh, and I wasn't um, very big headed about it. I was just thinking about my own personality and who I am. And I began to unpick a few aspects of my my character. And 
I knew I was non-binary. I had known for a while I was non-binary, but I was very uncertain about talking about that because I was worried that it might affect my career because I hadn't seen any representation of people like me, especially a deaf person like me. Uh, there was no access to that sort of information out there. I had not ever seen any examples of it from anywhere else. So when I got the role in Oliver Twist, I was really, really nervous because I thought I'll probably be the only non-binary person in that team. How will I fit? Will I fit? Or will I feel completely isolated as a result of it? And I was blown away by it, actually, because when I got there, everybody was really open and it was they were just a really nice bunch of people. And it was like, you're welcome. Just be who you are. You're welcome. And I really appreciated that. And I will always appreciate it. I still do, because from there was um, a costume designer specifically that I remember who was really supportive, really helpful. Uh, about my non-binary identity and she said to me what do you need and I said well what do you mean what do you need and she said well what do you need uh, to make sure that you are uh, do you want a sports bra or do you want binding or what would you like to make sure that it will flatten your chest a bit in order to take that role on and I thought she gets it she really understands it and after I've gone through that I was absolutely fine and I thought to myself at that point I am fine I'm great, it, and it, I needed that. I really needed it to happen, but we need more and more things like that to happen. And the only way that will happen is through representation. That's why representation is so important. I want to see more authentic, true stories out there by lots of different people, all being themselves, but being their true selves. And that's my dream is what I want to see is a lot more representation. Yes, absolutely. Talking about um, being non-binary, sometimes it's very difficult to, um, you know, like for example, Spotlight, the casting website, didn't have the option of selecting that before. So mm. that was very difficult mm. to sort of show that about yourself as an actor. Um, and I think it's the same that um, some of us were nominated for the stage awards uh, and... Uh, and the, the categories being actor or actress, it's like, oh, you know, what's that about? So, you know, we sort of sent an email saying we don't sort of agree with having those categories phrased that way. Um, and we wanted to make a point about, you know, that's very binary and there's no representation uh, on things like spotlight or equity for people who identify as non-binary or for different uh, in, uh, identities. So that's one thing. And as a writer myself, I've realized that I've wanted to, I realized I wanted to become a writer because I want to write the stories that I want to see. You know, I want to write something that would interest me on stage that represents what I want. The National Theatre of Scotland contacted me and asked what I wanted for a project for writing for them. And, you know, I said, what about writing about a queer deaf person? And they were like, oh, okay, what about, you know? And I was like, nope, I want a queer deaf actor for this because I am queer and, you know, in what I've written here, I don't want a hearing actor to play a deaf character. I don't want a straight person to play a queer role. I want accurate representation for this piece I'm writing. So my number one priority was a non-binary actor. And, and so they were thinking, you know, where is there going to be a deaf non-binary actor that we could find. So I was like, well, <laughs> Brooklyn, <laughs> there they are. So they someone. got that role. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So it's so important when you're telling the stories. Uh, at the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, they created a character for me that matches me, who I am, and that was lovely. But I would love to see more characters written for people like me so I can really connect to that experience, you know, so um, I can bring in all that subtext and I, to, 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 when I deliver the line, all of that subtext is there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, Mama. Go, yeah, go ahead. Linked to the audition process. It was quite difficult because they wanted to 
people want to give me female roles. And I was saying, no, 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 no. I don't feel that that's a good match for me and a good fit for me. And it was quite a struggle sometimes. And I would just like to plant a seed for the audience just to show them that a non-binary person can get any role. It doesn't matter whether you're playing, whether you are male or female or how you identify, you can play males or females or any other role. It's a skill matter. That's all it is. And I just wanted to show that that's what it's all about. The identity, how you identify, doesn't matter. You can play all the roles. Right. Thanks, Steve. That's so right. So mm -hmm. true. I wholeheartedly agree. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we know, like, it goes without saying, really, but we're going to say it anyway. We need more people to be writing um, all sorts of different people in these stories because we're bored of seeing the same faces and the same stories over and over again from the same perspective. I mean, actually, uh, you know, I'll just tell a little personal story just now as well. I remember I went to see a play when we could go, go and see to the theatre. Remember that? Uh, and it was uh, at the fringe and it was very much strong female writer, strong female story, strong female you know, perspective. And I was like, yes, amazing. And I went with my other half, who is uh, a man, identifies as a male. And he was just a bit like, oh, I don't really get it. And I'm going, but, but you, it's not for you. Like, it is for you because you should be watching this and understanding a different perspective. But um, but this is my story that I'm finally seeing on a stage. And it's that feeling, you know, and, we, and thankfully, you know, we are seeing people like yourselves up on stage. So maybe kids who do identify as non-binary or queer or deaf or any of, of uh, the labels that we, we want to put our identities, that we want to say about ourselves. Um, if we can recognize that and we can learn from that, then yes, 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 yes. Um, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So we'll set that's what set the world, world to right. It's brilliant. Um, I just want to talk a wee bit about the costume designer, Brooklyn, that you mentioned there, because my next kind of question was really around kind of who are the people making the change? Who are the change makers? Who are the folks that are, you know, rallying the the, the really championing representation, you know, who are the people um, making these uh, changes? And I thought we were going to have a conversation about these big, powerful people, but actually maybe it is just more about the costume designer having the knowledge and um, being aware enough to sort of ask you what you need. Um, I wonder, is, is there, are there other people... Uh, <laughs> Are there other people um, that you want to, you know, shout out, give them a shout out for kind of being awesome in that way? The change makers. Uh, like who? No. Like who? So, I don't really understand. I can yeah, you just clarify yeah, yeah, yeah. what, what you're I looking can. for. So somebody made a decision to put you up on stage, Brooklyn, right? They'd made a decision to not go for a hearing person, to not go for someone who identifies as a boy because Oliver Twist is traditionally played by a male person. You know, they made the decision to go with you because you're a beautiful, subtle, brilliant actor that's going to give so much to the role. Um, and I didn't see it, but I know that's what, it was. Um, um, I'm wondering who's making these decisions. Who can we can we say yes, well done? So. Everybody, <laughs> anyone and everybody, you know, everyone. Uh, it can be anybody, can it? It could be. Um, uh, yeah. It's a really good question, actually. Um, To be honest, I think I'd say to anybody, don't be frightened. Just ask. Anybody can do this. All you need to do is ask people what they need. What, what are your access needs? For any group, that's always the thing that you need to ask. And the thing to yes. do is not to be afraid, but just come out and ask it. If you're not sure what people need, yeah, maybe we'll make mistakes, but that's how we learn. So ask, make a mistake, learn. Brilliant. Great, 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 great. Um, so 
that that's that's brilliant. Um, and you mentioned um, when you were chatting there about a, a piece you uh, performed with the National Theatre of Scotland, and you did it together. Um, so this brilliant collaboration that was written by B and performed by Brooklyn. And uh, I have a little bit of a description about it here. So it's a, a piece called Squeezy Yogurt. Um, and you play the character Alexis. Um, Alexis has never had an easy time opening up about mental health. Um, how could you when every conversation needs an interpreter and nobody seems to take your problems seriously? Luckily, they might have found the perfect person to talk to. Now, if they can just stop the video call from playing up. Uh, and I, I did see this piece and I just want to say it was really lovely. Um, so I've got several questions that I'd uh, like to ask you about. One is a very, very important question. Uh, Brooklyn, how many yogurts did you have to eat in the filming of Squeezy Yogurt? A few people have asked me that question. <laughs> and I don't know if you're really ready for my answer. I am but ready. We bought two boxes, two full boxes of squeezy yogurts, froobs, they were. And we used How many was that? All of them. How many in How one many box? In box? Was it three three times three times? There must have been what, fourteen? I can't 16, actually remember. 16. Two boxes of eight, that's 16. <laughs> oh, my mouth is shocking. I'm really sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so we got the two boxes. And I had to practice all the time through rehearsals, drinking the yogurts. And I remember the stage manager said to me, um, Brooklyn, be really careful because this yogurt has a bit of a laxative effect and if you drink too much of it you may have a problem and I thought oh I've never thought about that so and that was fine I'm relieved to say I was very I was fine it, it, I, it didn't cause me any serious problems in that respect but by the time we got to the actual filming day I'm really sorry to make you laugh about this but by the time we got to the filming day I had actually run out of yogurt. They had finished, I had used them all up. So what we had to do on the filming day was I had to take a tube and artificially in, blow into it and inflate it and make it look like it had yogurt in it and pretend that I was actually sucking out the yogurt because there wasn't any yogurt in the tube when I was finally filming it. So that's a, a class in how to act drinking yogurt when there is none in the tube. Well, I feel oh, like my I, goodness. I need to give you an applause for that because that is just amazing. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I feel like I've been cruel, like I forced the actor to eat so much yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the lovely thing about writing though, right? You just go and they write, they eat all the yogurt and then you give it to the actor and then the actor goes, all right, okay, yeah, cool, great. <laughs> That's amazing. I had no idea you were going to say that. That's brilliant. That is, that's fantastic. Just that's an advert for the yogurt stuff for anyone that's clogged up. Okay, I'll stop talking now. Stop talking about that now. Um, <laughs> um, and, and you two working together again, how was that as a cl collaboration? This is where you'd say it was awful. It was great. Yeah, it was lovely. Really good to work with B again. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We've worked Same. together many, many times over the years, and every time we have a great time. It was lovely. And it was useful also to have be involved with um, her role, and EJ was involved oh, with the role as BSL as well, a BSL consultant. And we had Emily, the director, Emily as well, who was also lovely as a director. So, yeah, it was great. B, tell us, talk about how it worked. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, it was just lovely to work with Jeff Actor. And a part of the reason I created it really was to work with my friends, to work with the Jeff Actor. So it was really lovely. Um, you know, I always remember us from DYT and the course, and now we've had this project. It's been a wonderful journey. I mean, Brooklyn's been my best friend for such a long time. We talk nearly every day. We play games together. Yeah. So, you know, video games. So, yeah, it was just it was so lovely to work together again. It was great.
That's, well, that sounds perfect, doesn't it? Getting to work with your best pal and make something really lovely. Um, B, I'm really uh, interested, though, to talk about the themes of the piece because I think what you did so well was you made this really conversational, chilled piece. Um, so it felt like the character was really just talking to, to us, which is what it was, like in a really conversational manner. But then what you, you did, you, you, you talked about deafness and you brought up like the barriers that deaf people experience every day. And you did that in a really simple example of the train announcement um, and the person not realizing um, that they'd missed their stop um, or they missed what, what was happening next. Um, and then you also talk about, you know, really big issues like mental health and uh, the character talks about having anxiety and depression. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit about that um, as a writer. Mm. Yes. So basically, I was walking to, uh, talking to Caroline from National Theatre of Scotland and she, we had a conversation about what I could write um, and I wanted to talk about the truth about deaf mental health because, um, you know, I think there's a statistic that deaf people are 10 times more likely to experience mental health issues, which I do myself, depression and anxiety. And, you know, there are a lot of things that I said it, and I put in the script that have actually happened to me. So, um, so, you know, the sort of experience that I've had with um, an old counsellor, the story about the train, you know, those, all of those are true things. When I talked to that counsellor, I realised that a bad counsellor can make things worse. And I didn't actually want that to happen again. Um, and so, you know, being queer as well, it can be... Um, What's the word? You know, if you're in a bad environment or, you know, I guess having that barrier on top of deafness, you know, that can cause, you know, uh, other issues. So I guess, you know, mental health is so important. It's essential to talk about it. We should all be talking about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. And it links back to what we were saying about representation as well, because and, and who is writing the work, you know, because you're able to write about these stories because you've lived them. Like your lived experiences uh, have created the artist that you are. And then and then we as an audience, we get to to learn about your experience. And, you know, as a hearing person, uh, we don't we don't miss announcements at a train station, you know, um, and and maybe some hearing people in the world they don't even think about that, you know, they 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 don't have any knowledge about the deaf world and they don't um, understand, uh, you know, what barriers are up there and and um, it's yes, really absolutely. Hmm. Yes, and sorry to interrupt you there, but just like mm. thinking about the deaf world, it's funny because a lot of my hearing friends said to me, why yogurt? Why were you using yogurt? Because that's not a very sort of professional if you're in a, um, with a counsellor, but it's a bit of a deaf joke, um, you know, about whether it were like eating through through a serious situation. I mean, when I went to see a counsellor, I was so anxious. And so like eating was almost like a way of dealing with that anxiety. So um I think, you know, some people might sort of say, why have you included that? Most people might not understand that reference, but deaf people will. And that's what's important. You know, a deaf audience is really important as well. You know, that's who I'm making it for. So, you know, that's that's why I included that. Not everything is designed for straight white cis men. That's not the primary audience all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, mate, I know, yeah. I know, I know, I know. And and I think, I just think it's great. Like, I'm like, yes, what else are you writing? What, el what else can I see that you've written? You know, um, I do know that you do have some more commissions. Do you want to chat about those for a bit? Yeah. Well, one's published. Yeah. One's been published. Uh, go ahead. One's already published. You can read it. It's in a book. Is it the poem, The Long Lost Lover? Is that? Is that? No, no is not the poem. It's called, Is This a Fairy Tale? And it's aimed at ages eight and over. 
young audiences and it's with four other plays it's in a book so it, they're positive stories for negative times that we call them so it's with a company called wonderfuls and again it's about depression and mental health and but it's aimed at young audiences and it's also about breaking the down stereotypes you know gender stereotypes you must be a man you must be a woman you know men can wear feminine clothing um you don't have to behave in a particular way you don't have you know this sort of to toxic masculinity you don't have to act that way um the witch is a counselor so you know there's loads of fun stuff like that in it oh wow that sounds amazing um you must send us the link we need to we need to know this we want to see this um Brilliant. And then uh, just to... Yes, move... I will, I will. Yeah, please do. Um, uh, so moving it a wee bit uh, to the side, but thinking about what you were saying there about, po what did you say, positive, positive somethings in a negative time? Somebody remind me. Oh, positive stories mm. for negative times. Lovely. That's I mean, lovely. really, the company, it's a Scottish company, Wonderfuls, they're a fabulous company. And, you know, they're thinking, what are young people doing in lockdown? What have they got? So they thought they'd commission six writers to write five stories. Um, that So it was paid. But it means that schools and youth theatres don't have to pay us to use our work so they can actually put on performances from those scripts. So I just thought it was a brilliant initiative. And the other four stories are really amazing as well. So, yeah, it's so lovely. But, um, you know, they'll send me a video soon because my script is a bit hammy, like it's really over the top acting, which is my favourite. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Oh, well, uh, please do let us know and we will get it out on our all our stuff and let people know. That would be amazing. I um, will. Uh, so, yeah, positive stories and negative time. Just to quickly um, chat about Brooklyn and um, uh, your sign song, because I really want to bring this up as well, because sometimes uh, yes. people don't associate music with someone who is deaf. Or uh, um, and uh, I think you know. For whenever I think about the sign song, I think about Brooklyn Melvin. Um, and I want to bring up one in particular um, that I saw throughout lockdown, and it me it was like a positive story in a, in a negative time for me. Um, it was a collaboration. It was a group of quite a lot of deaf artists in it, and it was a signed translation of the BBC's live lounge version of Times Like These. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was just really powerful, it was really beautiful. And I just wondered if you could chat a little bit about how that came about. How did you get involved with that kind of project? Really, it was a completely random out of the blue thing that happened. One day, I got a Facebook message, and it was from the guy. What, what am I talking about? It was from a guy called Jack Smallwood from Wolverhampton, and I recognised his face from various festivals and things, but I'd never been properly introduced to him. And he sent me a message and explained how his aim for this was to create a song that would motivate the deaf community through all the issues of the pandemic and the coronavirus and the way a lot of people were feeling low and isolated and depressed and asked me if I would like to join in in order to create something that would help the deaf people and motivate deaf people and I said of course I would anything that helps and encourage and motivate people I'm there absolutely in there so yeah I'll be in and they gave me one verse and then the verses were split into odd little sections. And I thought, well, I'll do my own translation and I'll film myself and send it off, which is exactly how it worked. And then they put it all together. Well, it was, it was so beautiful. I kind of hoped that's what you were going to say. I kind of hoped that it was just a, a somebody just reaching out to a community of people that had these skills and then a coming together of this. And it... it you do a beautiful job but i think the whole thing is is just really beautiful and really poignant and it was a it was a positive story in a negative time for me if you like um and thank you for that it's really lovely 
really lovely. And if you haven't seen it, please do check it out. Um, I, folks, we are so close to finishing. So uh, before we finish up, I do have one quite big question for you. Because um, I think this will give us a real insight into you guys as artists. And that's what's really fascinating. Um, if you had unlimited budgets, no money at all, uh, all the money, I mean, all the money, unlimited budget, all the money, no worries about the money. What project would you make the National Theatre of Scotland come to you and they say, what do you want to make? No, no worries about the money. What, what are you going to make? Who is involved? What is it? And Brooklyn. I <laughs> would love to create a deaf musical. Something like the Spring Awakening that was done in America. Yes. But I want that here. I would love to make something like that. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, me. yes. Uh, same. Well, there's two. One would be their musical. And the other, I am part of, I can't spell, it's the Sphinx Lab. And it's a, I've got a writing commission. It's an all-female writing commission. So I've just been putting all sorts of ideas down on the page. And I really love what I've been creating, actually. So it's a weird world that I've imagined where people are forced to be happy. So it's like a dystopian future, sci-fi. Um, you know, I'd love to put that on at the National Theatre or wherever, like a great, a wonderful venue. Um, and in that, I will explore deafness and sign language as well. And I would also really want to explore two other main themes. So the top 1%, you know, the 1%, fuck them, the rich, <laughs> the very top 1%. And the other one, um, oh, I can't stand it. You know, oh, I just feel like all my tax dollars that I'm paying, got any money, and then all those rich people just not paying anything. Oh, that is a big thing. Um, and then secondly, obviously, again, as a <laughs> mental health, as you know, is my favourite. But in this weird dystopian way, I'd want to explore it. So people are literally forced to be happy. If you're not happy, get out. I love it. Yes. Because I don't see enough sci-fi, actually, in theatre. I'm a massive fan of fantasy, sci-fi, and it's so rarely staged in the theatre. That is so true. So you, we've you've got those ideas. I love Star Trek. I don't, what is it? This? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Brooklyn? Oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't do it right. It's getting, it's getting spicy <laughs> it's in touching. here. Sorry. <laughs> amazing. Um, uh, amazing. Amazing. So we've got those. We're going to put them in the universe and they're going to come back. That's going to happen now. Okay. Someone's going to watch this. And they're going to be like, there you go. There's your money. It's going to happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Okay. So now it is time for the quick fire round. So if you've been watching the videos thus far, you'll know that this is how we end the session. All right. So uh, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a this or a that. You pick your favourite. Fast as you can, no hesitation. Watching you. Okay. <laughs> you ready? Ready? You ready? You ready? Okay. Yeah. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Coffee. Great. Cat or dog? Dog. Cat. Oh, wow. Cat, like I've got a cat. <laughs> Costume or set? Costume. Costume. Oh, okay. Um, sea or mountain landscape? Sea. sea. Absolutely Yay. love Yay. the sea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stage fighting or dancing? Stage fighting, absolutely, 100%. Dancing. Ah, interesting. Brooklyn, what did you say? Stage fighting, <laughs> getting in the mix. That's no, me. I'm dancing. <laughs> um, pub or restaurant? Pub. Pub. Pub or restaurant? Restaurant. Definitely restaurant. Um, yeah. 
was like sweet, eight. fancy. How fancy? <laughs> <laughs> sweet or savory? Savory. Ooh, uh, oh, asking a Thai person that both, both in one, sweet and savory in one. Oh, mm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you have it. Okay, you have it. All right, late night or early morning? Late, late, yeah, <laughs> late night. <laughs> I'm owl. I'm a night yeah. owl. It's because you're both in your twenties. Um, all right. This is gonna be a tricky one. I or no? No, no, no. Twenties. No. Who? Who? Oh. Who's in their twenties? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I'm over thirty. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh, I didn't know. Oh, I feel really <laughs> old now. Brilliant. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, I. Oh, bye bye. I'll leave now. <laughs> hey. I, I or no? I, I, no. I, 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 brilliant. I, brilliant. I, brilliant. I, 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 I,
favourite green room? What green room holds a special place in your heart? Tell us. B. Um, hmm. At the Royal Shakespeare Company, the rehearsal room in London, it's maybe a little bit sort of old and messy, but the environment's really nice. It's like a place to meet the other actors. And that's when I first worked with a deaf actor called William Grint, and we just got on so well. We're really close now. So we would sit there and have something to eat. We'd play games. I Yeah, I love that. Clap, clap. I think that was what we did. Yeah, it was yeah. great. Oh, I love William. Shout out to William. Yay! Yay! Yes. <laughs> and he's actually here with me. I saw him yesterday in real life. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. In real life. That's really exciting. It will tell him we send our love. Yes. I've forgotten what it's like to meet another deaf person actually face to face. Oh, that. <laughs> The struggles are real. Um, Brooklyn, your favourite favorite green room? Well, Leeds Playhouse was my first. So I'll have to say that one for now. But again, maybe ask, ask me in a few years and I, I might have a different answer. Yes, amazing, amazing. Um, uh, folks, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, chatting to you all. Um, I'm going to do some thank yous and a goodbye. Um, here we go. Thank you for joining us in the green room this week. Um, and thank you to everyone out there who's been watching and listening. Uh, a massive thanks to Erin, the voice of B, to Julie, woohoo, the voice of Brooklyn, to Anna, the, inter the BSL version of me, um, to David, Trevor and Harry, who are busy, busy, busy um, working in the background, doing all the hard work. They are the unsung heroes of this project. Um, wow. Thanks also to the fellow DH Ensemble members and to Hot Coles for all being fabulous. Um, what a team. And finally, a massive, massive thank you to B and Brooklyn for being open and honest and generous and kind and giving us their energy and thoughts. And uh, I'm totally honoured um, to have known you both for such a long time. And it's been an absolute pleasure to see you flourish and grow as artists and as people. Uh, and I just want to say that publicly. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you so much. And ah, thank you. If thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you for me as well. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have enjoyed this conversation and you would want to join in the chat, please leave a comment uh, in the YouTube comments um, or you can use the hashtag, that's hashtag the green room underscore UK um, uh, on all the social medias. We are there um, and we really look forward to um, seeing you and speaking to you and chatting to you about all the cool things that we've been talking about. Um, and that's us today, folks. Thank you very much. And uh, signing off. We'll see you next week for The Green Room. Bye! Guests, B. Webster and Brooklyn Melvin. Host, Jennifer Bates. Interpreters, Anna Kitson, Erin Hutching and Julie Thompson. Music, Road Trips. Off Shane, The Green Room, a video podcast produced by Strive, a collective made up of the DH Ensemble and Hot Coals Productions. You can find all the videos and audio recordings of this series at www.strivecollective.org forward slash the hyphen green hyphen room. Twitter at Strive Collective with no E. Hashtag the green room underscore UK. Celebrating best practice, spotlighting unsung heroes, inspiring action. Logos for Strive, Hot Coals Productions and the DH Ensemble supported using public funding by Arts Council England.